Hello. We're going to be discussing the long-acting pipeline for HIV treatment now. These are my disclosures. I'm going to review these um, formulations based on their route of delivery. And so the first route of delivery we're going to talk about are subcutaneous uh, long-acting antiretrovirals. And there is one of these, the HIV capsid inhibitor lenacapavir. It has a unique mechanism of action and blocks the assembly of HIV at more than one point. It also has a unique resistance profile and no overlapping resistance with other antiretroviral drug classes. The drug is given subcutaneously and has an exceedingly slow elimination by that route. Originally, the drug required a three-dose oral load-in, but recently data presented at the International AIDS Society meeting in Montreal in, in July of 2022 showed that a simplified um, loading regimen involving only two oral doses given at day one and day two, with the subcut initial subcutaneous injection given on day one produced drug concentrations that were overlapping and nearly identical to those produced by the older, more complicated um, oral loading regimen. And that's shown in, in this figure. Now, lenacapavir was recently approved in the, um, uh, by the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, for treatment of heavily treatment experienced patients who had multi-class drug resistance. And the drug is pending approval in the United States. And that approval was based on this study, the Capella study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year showing that lenacapavir during a, a, a monotherapy run-in period, uh, not monotherapy, but when added to an optimized background regimen, um, significantly lowered viral load and heavily treatment experienced as compared to those randomized to receive placebo. In addition, the RNA changes um, at 26 weeks were um, indistinguishable between these two groups um, uh, as shown in uh, part B of this figure. And then finally, T cell responses were quite robust uh, with the lenacapavir-based uh, regimen. Now, um, although lenacapavir has uh, a very long half-life, no overlapping resistance with other drug classes and, uh, uh, and um, is exceedingly well tolerated, it can produce drug resistance. And these are data that were also presented at the IAS meeting uh, this past July, looking at resistance emerging in individuals who were treatment, uh, treatment naive, who were treated with um, lenacapavir. Um, it's important to note that there was no observed baseline resistance uh, in uh, either of the large phase three studies of this drug. Um, so that's good news. However, resistance can emerge particularly in individuals who, in this case, were not adherent to their daily oral regimen. Um, now, the good news, the other good news about lenacapavir resistance is that um, uh, lenacapavir resistant mutants have substantially reduced replication capacity and therefore reduced fitness. And so when lenacapavir is uh, stopped, is discontinued, uh, the uh, 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 wild-type virus uh, returns in the patient rather quickly, and these patients can be suppressed uh, with, other, with other drugs. Lenacapavir injections are very well tolerated, um, and that's shown in this figure that was presented at IAS uh, this past summer. Um, in both the Capella study, which was carried out in heavily treatment experienced patients, and the Calibrate study, which was carried out in treatment naive patients, the vast majority uh, reported no injection site reactions with their subcutaneous uh, injections. And there were only a handful of grade two and grade three injection site reactions. And so almost all individuals who received this drug 
subcutaneously uh, will tolerate it quite well. And I think that's also very good news. Now, the next the route of delivery we're going to talk about are long-acting oral antiretrovirals. And there is one of these in clinical development. It's this drug is Latrovir. It is a nucleoside analog with a unique mechanism of action. It is incorporated into the RNA DNA duplex because it has a three prime hydroxyl in the ribose ring, but it freezes the polymerase complex and therefore inhibits HIV by acting as a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. It has a very long plasma half-life of 50 to 60 hours and an even longer half-life over 100 hours for its active metabolite, the intracellular triphosphate. It was in development as an oral weekly version for treatment and an oral monthly version for PrEP uh, and has a significant activity in monotherapy studies as shown here. But in November of 2021, last year, Merck announced that they had discovered unexpected decreases in lymphocyte counts and CD4 counts in clinical trials with this drug. And the United States Food and Drug Administration um, closed further accrual to these trials and halted prevention trials in December of 2021. Now, the good news is Merck report, reported at EAX in Glasgow um, recently that the decreases in total lymphocyte counts and CD4 counts were dose dependent. Uh, the clinical hold was therefore removed for daily oral HIV treatment trials in September, and the daily oral maximum dose was reduced from 0.75 milligrams to 0.25 milligrams per day in combination with deraverine, a, do a dose that is expected to maintain the anti-HIV activity um, without producing decreases in lymphocyte counts. In addition, weekly oral HIV treatment trials of Islatrovir in combination with the oral formulation of the drug we just talked about, the HIV capsid inhibitor lenacapavir, are in development and are expected to open soon. Oral Islatrovir prevention trials remain on clinical hold, and the Q monthly oral Islatrovir, 60 or 120 milligrams once a month, is unlikely to progress further in clinical development. In addition to Islatrovir, this drug, MK8507, was uh, being uh, developed with uh, 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 Islatrovir as a once-weekly oral version. This is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor that has a very long uh, plasma half-life of about 70 hours and is also a very potent drug, as shown in this figure. This drug is also available for a clinical development in a once-weekly oral format in combination with drugs like Islatrovir or Lenacapavir. Now we're gonna to move to implantable antiretrovirals and there are one group of implants uh, in clinical development currently and those are the subcutaneous implants of tenofovir alafenamide. One of these candidate implants is shown in this uh, figure. Uh, this particular implant has an inert um, uh, 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 scaf uh, inert, inert silicon scaffold with delivery channels and a, a polyvinyl uh, alcohol membrane and a pure core of uh, tenofovir alafenamide. Now, when inserted subcutaneously in dogs, this implant delivers uh, tenofovir alafenamide uh, very slowly and for a very long period of time. In the red triangles here, you see the concentrations of intracellular tenofovir diphosphate, the active metabolite of that drug, um, showing a very high concentrations of tenofovir diphosphate um, delivered in these dogs for uh, more than 40 days, suggesting promise for long-acting delivery of tenofovir alafenamide uh, in humans. Now, early versions of half implants showed, some showed significant local toxicity, including tissue necrosis. An analysis published last year by Joe Romano and his colleagues showed that the degree of local toxicity of TAF implants was a function of the release rate of TAF from the implant. 
calf implants that released the drug at less than one milligram per day produced little or no local toxicity. And these kinds of implants are the ones that are moving forward in clinical development, um, initially for HIV prevention, but they have the possibility of being combined with other antiretrovirals. And they have the added advantage that they will also have activity against hepatitis B virus, which is not true for any of the other long-acting antiretrovirals in current clinical development. We're going to talk next about intravenous antiretrovirals. And there is one large class of intravenous ARVs in clinical development, and that is the broadly neutralizing anti-HIV monoclonal antibodies. Now, in this figure, the circled antibodies are antibodies that have entered clinical development. And as you can see, there are quite a few of these. However, there is pre-existing resistance to a number of these antibodies. And when they're given as monotherapy, resistance emerges very quickly. And so future studies of monoclonal antibodies will require giving a combination of monoclonal antibodies or combining them with long-acting small molecules. It's important to keep in mind that broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies are long-acting products. And what makes them long-acting products is a two-amino acid change in the FC binding domain of the antibody. And what's shown in this figure is the significant decrease in clearance and extension of elevated concentrations of antibodies in the plasma uh, when a, a, um, an unmodified antibody in the purple, in this case, VRCO1, uh, is uh, given as the VRCO1LS modification shown in the green. Uh, a second antibody in this figure, VRCO7, has also been given a, 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 as the LS modification, showing also um, increases in, in, in concentrations and extension of the half-life, although not as great as that shown with the VRCO1 LS. And so I think we still have a lot to learn about, um, uh, about what these modifications do and how they're going to affect different antibodies. These antibodies can be given, by the way, as infrequently as once every six months. So what will the future of antiretroviral drug delivery hold? Um, there's a lot going on. This is a very rich field. In addition to the products I discussed with you today, uh, there are microarray or micro needle patches that can be given uh, get, that can be put on the skin to deliver antiretroviral drugs uh, transdermally. There are new implant technologies that will uh, uh, deliver uh, more drug uh, for longer periods of time. There are bioerodible implants that would not have to be inserted or removed surgically. There are combination technologies, for example, combining a depiverine vaginal ring with hormonal contraceptives uh, to uh, not only prevent HIV, but also prevent pregnancy. There are gastric reservoirs that can uh, uh, be taken orally and remain in the stomach to deliver antiretrovirals in combination for seven to 14 days. And then finally, there are strategies for reducing the injection volume of drugs like intramuscular cabotegravir and rilpivirine. So keep uh, uh, keep your eye on this field, uh, keep informed because there's a lot going on and there are a lot of changes coming up in the way we will be able to deliver antiretrovirals for treatment. So I would like to thank those who shared with me uh, materials that I presented with you today. Some of it is unpublished. Um, I would also like to refer you to the long acting extended release antiretroviral research resource program LEAP website longactinghiv.org that has a wealth of information about what's happening in this field and will help to keep you up to date. Thank you.